Welcome back. Uh, this is the second of the lectures that introduce multi-level modeling. Creatively, I've named it Multi-Level Models 2. You can, you can imagine in your head that it also says Electric Boogaloo, if anybody remembers that movie. No? Okay. Shame on you. Um, I think I should give you an update on where we are, and, and partly because I had to do this this morning to figure out what we're going to get done with. So today is, uh, let, let me frame this a bit by saying you've learned a tremendous amount. You have. It, it probably burns uh, the amount of learning <laughs> that you have accomplished, right? The, that burning sensation means the medicine is working. And uh, you, you have a tremendous amount of statistical power at your fingertips now. Uh, you can fit quite complicated models. And with the introduction of multi-level models, the possibilities are going to open up really rapidly. And uh, what I want to do today in finishing the introduction to multi-level modeling is teach you some of the more um, technical things about them uh, so you can use them more responsibly and make very good use of it. And we're going to need these tools next week when I crack it open even more and we'll have some more elaborate uh, but routinely useful kinds of models like varying slopes where we extend uh, the varying, the adaptive prior approach of varying intercepts to many clusters of parameters at the same time, all co-varying with one another at some hyper level in the model. And this will also let us do things like um, multivariate outcome models, which we'll use to uh, fit instrumental variables. This is a return to causal inference, something more than the backdoor criterion that lets you get causal inferences. Even in cases where you can't close all the back doors, if everything else is just right and you believe your DAG, you can still get a causal inference using something called an instrumental variable. Um, there's also a front door criterion, which I think I'll mention, but won't have an example of, just for the sake of time. And I want to introduce a basic kind of network model called the social relations model, which is also, uh, it's a custom varying effects sort of model. But it's custom. The covariance matrix is scientifically informed. <coughs> well, <laughs> we'll see what that means when we get there. Uh, but this is all about the responsible conduct and the possibilities that open up from understanding varying effects. And then week 10 is the end, and I'll spend uh, the first lecture that week telling you about Gaussian processes, which are, um, to my mind, an extension of the varying effects approach to an infinite number of categories, which I know sounds scary, but actually uh, some of you know adding infinities makes things easier in math, not harder. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's opposite to the real world. Infinity solves problems in mathematics. Um, this will be very, very useful for routine kinds of uh, variables like distances, phylogenetic distances, spatial distances, where there's covariance amongst the <laughs> units, uh, and, but they're not categorically discrete. Uh, there's some continuous distance that we need to use to categorize them. Uh, similarities. Age is another kind of thing like this, right? And then on Friday, um, measurement error and missing data, topics that are common to everything uh, that we do in the sciences, whether you do experiments or observational studies these things happen. <clears throat> so into the material for today. Uh, this is the slide we ended on on Monday. We're going to pick up again with the pro-social chimpanzee data set. Very quick summary just to, just to remind you. Uh, this is an experiment with a um, small number of individual chimpanzees, many repeat observations on each, in uh, four different experimental treatments which combine the, which side of a table, left or right, a pro-social food option is on, pro-social is our interpretation. Uh, the question of, is whether they interpret it that way. <laughs> and uh, so the pro-social side means both um, individuals get food. Uh, the other option, the non-pro-social option, is only the uh, experimental individual gets food. Uh, the other kind of treatment is whether there's a partner present. And so in this fantastic piece of art on this slide, there is a partner present. But if the other end of the table were empty, then isn't. And so remember, we're interested in whether chimpanzees pull the pro-social option more often when there's a partner present. And the answer was no, <laughs> right, at least in this experiment. Um, I want to use this data set again, since you're already familiar with it, uh, there'll be less friction. Uh, I want to use it to, to show you how to build a more complicated types of, of varying effects model where we've got more than one kind of cluster in, at the same time. This is a very common type of data structure called a cross-classification model. What's cross-classified here are the individual chimpanzees, which are called actors in this data set, and the experimental block. Experimental block is basically which day, 
right? So there are block effects because maybe they were all you know, grumpy, the weather was bad, then they were extra hungry, so they all pulled the pro-social option more in some particular block. It could happen, right? Block effects happen. <laughs> the terror of science is block effects. It's one of the reasons you want to randomize the order you feed your uh, DNA samples through the machine, right? So there aren't block effects, time effects correlated with your treatments, right? You've got to decorrelate the blocks in the treatments. Uh, very common thing. So um, in this uh, data set, it's nice. Everything's balanced. You've got all the chimpanzees and all the blocks. It's amazing they pulled this off. Uh, chimpanzees will do anything for a grape, right? So as some of you know. And um, so we're going to be interested in using both of these types of clusters. That is, actors are a type of cluster because you've got multiple observations in each individual chimpanzee. So you can estimate parameters that are specific to that chimpanzee, like handedness, right? Um, you've also uh, got repeat observations inside blocks. There are blocks, and it's a day, and there are a bunch of observations within each block, and so the blocks can differ on average. And that's how we measure the block effects, which are noise that is interfering with inference, right? Um, these kinds of models are called cross-classified, but as you'll see, you can just design them like a bearing intercept model. Uh, there's nothing about the data structure that, that really distinguishes cross-classified from, say, something that's nested, except your interpretation of it. The model looks the same. Uh, what does it actually look like? Okay, so here's the uh, multi-level chimpanzee model with um, both actor and block intercepts. I draw your attention to the linear model part of this slide. You'll see that there's an alpha for each actor, there's a gamma for each block, and then there's a beta for each treatment. So each particular observation is getting an offset from each of these effects. Um, the betas for each treatment are ordinary fixed effects is not an adaptive prior. We're regularizing, but we're, it's not adaptive. There are four treatments. The alphas are the varying intercepts on actor. These are just like the tank effects in the tadpole example from Monday, if you remember that. Yeah? So it's the same sort of thing. And this is the handedness, right? The interpretation would be this is the handedness of the individual because the outcome is uh, the left, pulling the left lever. There are seven actors. This is an adaptive prior. As you see, there's an alpha bar. And there's a sigma alpha, which is the variation. And so the model's going to learn this prior from the data, just like with the tanks. And then we've got another uh, adaptive prior in here. This one is the gammas. There's a gamma for each block. There are six blocks in the data set. Um, this is an adaptive prior because there's a sigma in it. This prior is conditional on a parameter. So the way to recognize that it's adaptive. Right? There's a parameter inside of it. There is no gamma bar. Why? You could put it there, but it would be redundant because then you'd be adding alpha bar and gamma bar inside the linear model, essentially. Right? So you just have some two things, like the left leg and the right leg, that you couldn't distinguish. Right? The effect of, remember that from some chapter way in the past? Uh, it won't destroy the model. It's just a redundancy that's unnecessary. It'll still run, um, uh, but it, it'll run less efficiently and it won't help you at all. So we can just put a zero there. Um, it's still an adaptive prior because the width of this prior is being learned from the data through this sigma sub gamma, which is a different standard deviation uh, than the others. And then we've got hyper priors at the bottom uh, for each of these. So the blue bits are the block, uh, the bits that apply to the block varying effects. Does this make sense, how the definition works? You can extend this strategy to have as many different cluster types as you like in principle. Right? And, and since you're using Stan as your Markov chain engine, in principle, it extends a very long way. You can have you know, tens of thousands of parameters, uh, if you like, in these things. And you can often sample them very efficiently. Um, what does the code look like? <clears throat> I'm going to walk through this slowly. So uh, hang on, and I'll highlight bits of it. This is the, the Ulam code version of the model on the previous slide. It's just a logistic regression with a bunch of stuff. Right? Uh, that's all, all we think about. We've got a logistic regression up top. We've got a linear model with uh, a vector of actor parameters, a vector of, of, of block parameters, and treatment parameters. And then this section in the middle with adaptive priors. Let me highlight for you the actor effects. So in the linear model, there's this A for each actor. And then we've got a vector of those. They get uh, each actor. A uh, parameter has this common prior, which itself has two parameters inside of it. It's conditional. That's what makes it adaptive. It's conditional on other parameters. 
And then down at the bottom in the hyperpriors, you see those two um, parameters that are that that are learned from the data that give the shape to the priors for the actors. This is what creates shrinkage. You're going to see you're going to get shrinkage here, just like with the tanks. Yeah. Um, and then the same thing for blocks, now shown in green. We've got block up in the linear model. We've got the block uh, adapted prior. And then there's the sigma uh, down at the bottom for blocks as well. Make sense? Easy, right? You just keep layering this stuff on. You have to manage it. <laughs> um, but uh, the strategy uh, grows naturally from there. OK. Um, should run this model at home. Remember, you always go home and draw the owl, right? Finish drawing the owl. Uh, you, you won't encounter uh, any major problems with this. Um, uh, and you summarize uh, the plot, the Precy output on the left. I'm showing you the B parameters are the treatment parameters. There's no new story here. Remember, uh, chimpanzees on average are attracted to the prosocial option, but not more when the partner's present. So there's, there's more food on the side of the table. They tend to pull that lever more, but they seem to be almost entirely insensitive, uh, if at all sensitive, to the presence of a conspecific. Um, the alpha parameters that come just next, these are the handedness ones. And you'll recognize sweet, sweet individual number two there, right? Uh, lefty, <laughs> right? Lefty has got a really big bearing intercept. Yeah, remember? Uh, pulled out number four on the, on the horizontal axis means basically always. Why is there such a wide posterior, marginal posterior distribution for lefty? Someone have an idea? What's that? Yeah, because all of them mean always, yes. So thank you, Ilaria. That, no, that's the most succinct version of it. Because all of them mean always. All those values that it covers mean always pull the left lever, right? And so the, the data can't tell you the value of that parameter except that it's really big. And that's what happens. If you didn't have priors, infinity would be <laughs> compatible with the data, right? But we know infinity is not a value we wish to consider, and that's what the prior says here. Yeah, does that make sense? You can't, four and five and six all make the same predictions. And so the data can't distinguish them. Yeah, so in GLMs, you always need priors for this reason, because the data just, the likelihood is insufficient to, to identify the parameters. It's just how reality is. It's hostile to human life. Um, so uh, then the G parameters that come below are the block effects, six block effects. You'll notice these are very small. They huddle around zero. So this is, means there's not much variation among blocks compared to the variation among actors. You can see this, yeah, and what's going on. Uh, down at the very bottom, we get our alpha bar, which is slightly left-handed in this sample, yeah. Uh, and uh, then the two sigmas, and you'll see the two sigmas tell the same story that you can see with your eyes, right? Your ocular scientific instruments. <laughs> you assess the variation among the intercepts for actor and the intercepts for block. You can see that the actors vary more than the blocks do, and the sigmas are picking that up, right? So the, the posterior um, uh, for sigma among actors is around two. That's a lot of variation, right? I mean, this is, this is not describing exactly your sample. It's trying to learn about a population that these chimpanzees came from. That's one way to think about it. So if you were going to take this experiment to a new colony and you wanted to have a prediction of the variation among the individual actors, so that you'd use that, for example, to know how many repeat measures you'd get on each individual, then this sigma would be useful for designing the experiment. We'll do some more with that at the end of the lecture today. Um, and then sigma g is practically zero. It's not exactly zero, uh, but it's very, very close to zero because there's not much observed variation among blocks. And then I've plotted those two densities for the two sigma variables in the right-hand part of this slide. Uh, block sigma sub g for the blocks is shown in blue. Sigma sub a for the actors is shown in black. And you can see how different these are. Does this make sense? So the consequence of this, what's the consequence? There's a lot more shrinkage among blocks. If one of the blocks were extreme, it got shrunk towards zero really aggressively. Uh, the actors, there'll be very little shrinkage because lefty, bless lefty, lefty proves that individuals, uh, chimpanzees are individuals, right? They have personality. <laughs> and, uh, okay. <clears throat> so um, it's natural to ask then, 
should we even have varying intercepts on block? And the answer is it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. You can put them in the model, it won't hurt anything. You can leave them out, you'll get the same inference, right? And the reason is because there's basically no variation among blocks. Uh, but it's a nice feature of varying intercepts, and varying effects in general, is that if there's not much variation among the members of that cluster type, it isn't harmful to add the varying effects because they get shrunk very aggressively in that case. And so what I'm trying to show you here is, here's the model, same model, but we've taken out uh, the block effects entirely in this model. You'll see that they're missing. There's nothing about block in this model, but we've got varying intercepts on the individuals still. And we can compare these two models using WAIC or, uh, or LU. You'll get the same numbers. And uh, you'll see that they're very, very similar models. Uh, their difference in WAIC is only two. Um, and the standard error is, is uh, very close to that as well. These are effectively the same models in terms of out of sample predictions. There's really nothing to get excited about in the difference. And um, you'll notice that the parameter counts uh, uh, difference is quite small. Um, Model 13.4 had uh, seven additional parameters because there were six blocks and one sigma in addition. Uh, but you'll notice that it's not seven more effective. PWAIC is only about 11, uh, whereas in the model that emits all those blocks, it's about nine. So it's like a two effective parameter difference, uh, you know, rounding. I like to aggressively round. Uh, <laughs> rounding, even though it has seven more parameters. But those parameters were aggressively regularized because the model didn't discover much variation among those units in the data. This is like the fail-safe device of varying effects. Yeah, and, and lots of machine learning works the same way. It doesn't use exactly this structure to do the adaptive regularization, but deep learning systems also have this way to consider many, many features and aggressively regularize the ones that don't matter. That's a nice thing. Regression trees, also another non-Bayesian way. Well, there are Bayesian regression trees, I shouldn't say that. Uh, regression trees are another strategy. Lots of regularization strategies. Um, that will do this for features that end up not being useful. Does this make some sense? Yeah, does it make enough sense that you could go home and draw the owl? That's really all I can hope uh, at this point. Yeah, you gotta go home and run the chain and draw the owl, right? Um, and play around with it and look at the predictions. Okay, um, let's add some more random effects, why not? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is also a chance for me to, to try and make fetch happen again, right? lots of this. Uh, this term random effects, which is a synonym for varying effects, <laughs> the word random has this uh, tendency to lead people to interpret uh, uh, the effects in a stronger way than I think is warranted. These are just statistical things that are used to regularize inference. Um, the source of the clusters is irrelevant to whether we add varying effects or random effects or not. But you will read in textbooks this advice that, um, you know, so we're considering the issue here of whether we could add varying intercepts on treatment. There are four treatments. We have repeat measures of each, right? Every chimpanzee participated in every treatment. We've got tons of data per treatment. Uh, we could, we want to regularize those, and we have in this model, but we have not adaptively regularized them. Why not? And um, some people will say, well, you can only put random effects or varying effects on things which weren't fixed by the experimenter. They're fixed by the experimenter, we call them fixed effects, and then you don't use adaptive priors. This is nonsense. It's just nonsense. It's, if you care about better, more accurate inferences, you use adaptive priors. That's all there is to it. Uh, so we can do this. It's fine. Uh, it doesn't matter. You don't, don't succumb to the mind projection fallacy that how you set up the data that determines how you should learn from it. <laughs> right. And um, so in, to, to do that, all we have to do is add a sigma beta to the prior for the B treatments instead of, I thought there was like 0.5 before, I think. I won't go back to the previous slide, but I think I made it 0.5. And if we just make it, a, a give it a parameter, we can learn it. Um, this is what the model looks like. Then I'm circling there the new uh, uh, adaptive prior for the treatments. Remember, there are four treatments, four B parameters. We get one more sigma down at the bottom. We got lots of sigmas now, right? <laughs> Stack them all up. And we run this model, it's no problem. And I'm just comparing this to the previous model. Model 13.6 is the one shown on this slide. 13.4 was the first one we did today or you've got varying intercepts for block and actor, but, but fixed regularized uh, treatment estimates. And they're the same, basically. They're slightly different. The new model uh, uh, does regularize the more extreme one, uh, beta two a little bit, but they're basically the same estimates. And why? Because there's tons of data uh, per treatment. 
right? So the varying, but you're learning the sigma, uh, but it doesn't change the estimates very much. It trims the posterior uncertainty a little bit uh, uh, because there's not much effect, uh, but it doesn't change your effective inference about the treatments at all. There's no harm done here. Um, okay. Uh, one of the things that will happen when you go home and draw the owl uh, is you will get these warnings that you have probably already seen occasionally, yeah? Have you seen these? There are these mysterious things called divergent transitions. You seen them? Yeah, they're great. They're kind of spooky. You get them and you have no idea what that means. Um, divergent transitions uh, are your friend in the sense that you're, they're telling you about something that is numerically inefficient about the Markov chain. If you have a very small number of them, it's hardly ever a serious issue, but it's easy to get rid of them. Uh, and there's a whole section in chapter 13 where I talk you through how to do this. And I want to spend some time today, uh, probably the next 15 minutes, talking about these and how we fix them because it teaches you something really important about multi-level models. And that is that we can write the same model different ways in the code. And even though they're mathematically equivalent, the Markov chain will see them as quite different. And often this is just a required thing. If you want to run these models and sample from them effectively, you need to be able to switch between the different ways of writing the same model. I know this sounds like madness. Uh, but even though the algebra will be equivalent, the geometry uh, is going to look really different to the Markov chain. So I want to give you some intuition of that. Um, so here's what you'll see. Uh, this is my R environment, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's glamorous. I, I know all the cool people use our studio. I have nothing against our studio, but there are some, uh, uh, there is some value to using the terminal. Like it doesn't crash as much as our studio. Uh, Jeff's not here today, but. Uh, if Jeff were here, he would nod his head vigorously about this. <laughs> so uh, you'll get these warnings, three divergent transitions after warm-up, and it gives you advice to increase adapt delta, in this case above 0.95, which is the default for Ulam. Um, sometimes that, that'll work, and adapt delta is this parameter I'll tell you about in a moment, what it does. Um, but sometimes that won't save you, and there's just nothing you can do except to reparameterize your model. So let's start, before we get to that, what that means to reparameterize your model, to saying what a divergent transition is. Uh, so forget about statistics for a moment and imagine you're on a frictionless roller coaster. <laughs> right, terrifying thought. <laughs> but a frictionless ro real roller coasters have friction and where the wheels touch the track there's a lot of friction actually. Right? You cook a sausage on a, on a roller coaster track. <laughs> right? uh, but uh, uh, imagine it's frictionless. Um, so as this roller coaster moves from point A to B to C to D <coughs> there are two forms of energy which are being adjusted, shifting. There's, amount of, there's a total amount of energy comes from the momentum of this roller coaster in this system, and it's frictionless, so it'll never stop moving, right? Uh, but the energy is in two buckets, and even though the total amount of energy is constant in the system, it has to be, that's all energy is in physics, right? It's this thing that balances the ability to do work, and it's got a bunch of like pockets you can put it in, but it has to be conserved. It's just a thing that balances equations, right? It sounds mysterious, energy, right? It's just equation balancing. And um, so as we start out at A and the roller coaster went down to point B, it lost potential energy, right? Potential gravitational energy because it was high and that it's converted to kinetic energy, to motion as it goes towards B. And then as it moves up from B to C, as it is pictured right now, it, the conversion goes the other way. That kinetic energy is converted back into potential energy, right? Because you get to the top of the hill. And then it'll roll from C to D and we'll do it again. And this is what roller coasters do, right? They just keep converting kinetic energy into potential energy and back and forth. But the sum of those two things is constant in a frictionless system. In a system with friction, energy is still constant, but you get heat, right? You get heat energy. Um, our Markov chains don't have heat energy, which is why I want you to imagine this is frictionless, right? It's, it's like your frictionless roller coaster. So. What is a divergent transition then? A divergent transition is when your roller coaster pops off the track, uh, right? So, um, and we can detect this inside the Markov chain uh, by monitoring the energy of the system, right? It's, it's a simulated physics, it's a physics simulation and it has energy. And in fact, in Hamiltonian dynamics, the Hamiltonian is the total energy of the system. And so it's actually conveniently calculated right inside the Markov chain. And if you look back at the chapter where I introduced this, there was a bunch of R code, which was naked Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and you'll see it there that I calculate the total energy inside that loop. Uh, and we use that to monitor the chain. If the, if the energy is not conserved in your chain, something's wrong, <laughs> right? And that, it means your numerical approximation is bad. 
and you popped off the track. Why would that happen? Because we don't actually have a smooth, continuous simulation. We have those little steps. Remember the little leapfrog steps? These little linear jumps, we're calculating a gradient, then we take a little finite step, and then we do it again. So we're getting a piecewise linear approximation of a smooth surface. And so if the pieces are small enough and the, and the roller coaster track doesn't bend too much, that's fine. But when the roller coaster track bends really violently, or your step sizes are big, then you can pop right off the track. And you want to monitor that so it works. And so these divergent transitions are when that happens. The transition is from one position in the Markov chain to another. That's a transition, right? Those smooth things uh, uh, that were drawn in the movies. And uh, divergent means it pops off the track, pops off the true surface, right? You don't actually pop off of anything inside the Hamiltonian simulation because it's a big manifold. But you know, you, you go off where you were supposed to be, and you recognize this because you can monitor the energy. So this is the summary slide to tell you all this. And there's a whole section in chapter 13 about this. Um, I want to show you some pictures to give you a little bit of intuition about it. And uh, so on the right here, I'm showing you a posterior distribution which tends towards divergent transitions. This happens a lot, almost any time you have a parameter that's conditional on other parameters. So let me, uh, oh, before I move to the next slide and explain uh, this thing, I want to say the, the bold statement at the bottom of this slide, other sampling strategies other than Hamiltonian Monte Carlo have problems with exactly the same kinds of services, but they have no way to monitor it because they've got no energy. Uh, so Gibbs sampling and all of those Metropolis Hastings based strategies, uh, they will just, they won't tell you when this is going on, but they definitely experience the same problems, but they don't have all these extra parameters like momentum that Hamiltonian Monte Carlo has, which seem like a bother at first, but turn out to provide diagnostics. So what I, one of the reasons to use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is because, well, it just works better uh, than the other things, especially in high dimension. But another reason, even if you're in low dimension, to use it is because it freaks out when things are wrong and the other strategies don't. You have to work much harder to get diagnostic information from them. Uh, so if you're paranoid like me, you like things that throw up warnings all the time. Yeah, <laughs> you love warnings. Don't turn off warnings. <laughs> That's a bad idea. It's like turning off your smoke detector. Very, very bad idea, right? If your smoke detector goes off when you cook in the kitchen, well, then open a window, right? Don't turn off the smoke detector. Same thing with Markov chains, right? Open a window. Uh, don't turn off the warnings. So uh, a little bit about divergent transitions. So let me show you uh, a routine kind of situation, and this arises all the time in varying effects models, um, where you get divergent transitions. It arises uh, through this effect that's often called in the literature the funnel. Uh, so this funnel is turned on its side. If you turn it so that the left-hand parts at the bottom would look more like a funnel. Um, what is going on here? I'm showing you a very simple posterior distribution. Two parameters, V and X. Uh, v has a normal 0, 3 um, prior. And uh, X is conditional on V, where the E to the V is its standard deviation. This is like an adaptive prior, right? Uh, X is conditional on V. When this is true, you can get very interesting shapes with very, very strong curvature. Uh, so what you're seeing is V on the horizontal here, right? That's that one. And now X, since the, the width of X depends upon V, as V gets small, X contracts. And you get this very narrow valley, right? And so do you think that part there uh, near, near where uh, the, the zero point on X, that's this very narrow valley with very high ridges, right? The, the funnel. Uh, and so your Markov chain has to get down in there and take some samples because it's part of the posterior distribution, uh, but the curvature is really tight there, so your roller coaster has tendencies to pop off. Uh, yeah, out in the big smooth plane where V is large, you, you can take big steps and move around on the big expansive plane out there and everything's good, but then you get into that valley and it's completely different. And a big problem here is there's no single step size which can efficiently explore both of those regions of this posterior distribution. The valley, you want a really small step size in the valley, otherwise you pop off right, the track, and you want a bigger one in the, uh, uh, out in the open area so you effectively explore it. Yeah. So uh, these kinds of posterior distributions um, are much more challenging for all kinds of samplers, and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is just nice is that it throws warnings about these things. So, you want know, to think about two kinds of behavior. 
Um, on the left, I've set the step size large and uh, I've colored in red divergent transitions. So I'm just monitoring the energy. And when the energy at the start of the transition is different from the energy at the end, that's a divergence. Now, and the Markov chain will reject these samples, right? You can reject samples with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and the rejection criterion is the difference between the starting energy and the ending energy. Yeah, because that means you've got divergences. So this doesn't necessarily corrupt your chain, but it does mean that it's way, way less efficient uh, than it could be. And it could induce subtle biases in the posterior distribution because the places where you do the rejections are particular regions of the posterior and you won't be sampling there. And so you won't be sampling the whole posterior distribution. Now in infinite time, you'll be fine. Yeah, right, but you don't have infinite time. Again, you gotta finish your PhD. So uh, I'm here for you uh, to help you figure that out. Um, the other criterion is we can make the step size small, uh, but then you could just spend all your time you know, missing the funnel completely, as in this one. I think I took 500 samples in each of these. So now, uh, Stan will do better than this. This is my handwritten Hamiltonian Monte Carlo code. It's got no adaptive anything going on, and I've just made some examples for you. Stan will sample from this quite well, this particular example. But as you increase the dimensionality, like stack up the x's, like in a varying effect model. In a varying effect model, you're not going to have just one x that's conditional on b. You could have hundreds of x's that are conditional on b. This gets pathological real fast in that circumstance. So we want to do something about it. What do we do? you got two strategies. You can increase adapt delta, which puts you in this scenario on the right. The divergencies go away, but you could spend a long time before it finds the funnel and take samples from it. Yeah. Um, also makes the chain run slower. However, that's a, that's a fine trade-off. I think uh, valid inference is, is worth waiting for. <laughs> yeah. um, the second option, which is often way more effective, is to reparameterize. And I should say you only undertake both of these steps, either of these steps, after you've looked hard at your model and made sure it's correct. Because in my experience, uh, when the chain is inefficient on the first go, it's because I did something stupid, like left out a prior completely. Like I have a parameter, it has no prior at all. That's like the most common, my own personal most common mistake. There's this uh, folk theorem I think I showed you earlier in the class. The folk theorem of applied statistics is that when you're having trouble estimating the model, it's usually because the model is wrong, right? <laughs> so that, the folk theorem holds. Uh, and the first thing you should do is look at the model and make sure it's all there. You didn't do something ridiculous. Um, after that, you can attempt both of these steps. So what's the reparameterized thing is weird when you first see it. So I want to spend some time explaining it. Okay. So it's a fact, a wonderful fact, that most any statistical model can be expressed several different <coughs> ways. In the formal mathematics, as you'd write them on the page, they're all perfectly transformable between one another. They're the same. Algebraically identical models. Let me show you some examples. Here's a really simple model. Alpha is some parameter that's conditional on mu and sigma. Yeah, you've seen these things in your dreams all the time, right? Alpha is conditional on mu and sigma. We can re-express this little model multiple different ways. We'll be focusing on the distribution of alpha, right? Alpha has some, some probability distribution. Here's another way to write it. Uh, we can say that alpha is deterministically the sum of mu, same mu as in the first line, plus some new parameter beta, and we assign beta distribution normal zero sigma. This Now alpha, uh, in the middle of this slide, bottom of this slide, has the same distribution as alpha at the top. You see this? We've just recentered it. We've taken mu out of the prior for alpha, and we've added it back on later. But you can always do this with a normal variable, right? You just translate it wherever you want it to be. Make sense? No, now you're thinking, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> why? Why would you do that? I'll show you why. But uh, right now, this is just about what you could do. Yeah, we're just in modal verb land. Uh, we're doing could and we'll do should later. So uh, we can go one step further. We can get sigma out of the distribution as well. Uh, now we say alpha is equal mu plus z times sigma, and we uh, assign z a normal 0, 1 parameter. Why, z is a z score, or a z score, if you come from a barbaric place. <laughs> no, sorry. This is a fight between Canadians and Americans, whether you say z or z, right? <laughs> I know some people have opinions about this. I don't. <laughs> but uh, uh, alpha is, is mu plus uh, z sigma, and z is normal 0, 1, but when we multiply those individual z's, 
by sigma, they're back on the scale that we want, right? Because sigma gives their width, gives the width of the target distribution. And then we add mu back in and it's translated to the position we want. And alpha in all three of these expressions is the same distribution. Does that make sense? Yeah? Good times? And I know, at this point, it's like, why would you do this? You could do this, yes, but it's like that uh, Jeff Goldblum thing. The scientists were so busy, right, asking what they could do that they didn't ask if they should or something. What's that? Jurassic Park? Anybody remember that? <laughs> no. Uh, we should do this sometimes, absolutely. Uh, and the reason is because even though it's mathematically the same, your roller coaster sees these distributions differently because the shape is different. The geometry that it has to cruise around on is different. And this is a cool effect in a very handy way to make your Markov chains more efficient. So on the left, we have the form, the kind of default form that I showed you. This is often called the centered form. Uh, this is not great terminology, but I, as always, I got to teach you the terminology that's in the papers. So how do you understand that it's centered? Um, the, there are parameters inside the distribution. So there are parameters that are conditional on other parameters. You know, since they've been located by sticking parameters inside them, I guess. I don't know. Someone invented this term. It didn't make sense then. You just have to learn it that way. Centered means that there are parameters inside the distribution. You have parameters that are conditional on other parameters. Non-centered is the radical version where we try to take all of the conditioning out of the distributions and stick it inside some linear model. And so the right-hand uh, version here is the non-centered version, right, where we have the z-score normal 0, 1 prior. Make sense? Just as a definitional issue right now. Let's look at the geometry of these two equivalent distributions. Right? We get the same information from each. On the left, we've got the one I showed you before, the funnel. Right? And I'm showing you some good Hamiltonian trajectories down to the funnel where we get divergent transitions. Right? The roller coaster goes down in there and then <laughs> flips over. Uh, right? and, um, and now the same thing, but in the non-center part, now we've got a Gaussian bucket again. And we can just cruise around this Gaussian bucket forever, doing nice, you know, oscillating paths. It's, it's beautiful, right? Uh, and that's what you get. They're the same distribution, actually. You can convert between them. But the one on the right is way easier to cruise around in on your roller coaster. Yeah, one of these is much more violent ride than the other. And so when we reparameterize to the version on the right, do our varying effects that way, you, you typically get uh, many more effective samples uh, from your Markov chain than you do on the left. So again, with my handwritten uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo code, not uh, effectively tuned or not, I'm showing you the difference in the funnel. Those red points are divergent transitions that are rejected. They're left out of the Markov chain. And um, you start back over where you started again, whenever that happens. And they're scattered around, um, but a lot of them are down in the funnel. And uh, the ones that are outside the funnel, by the way, are ones that start in the funnel. Right, because you start in the area of high curvature and you get out of it, you still have a divergence. Uh, so, and then on the right, same settings, uh, same <coughs> distribution, no divergences at all, 100% acceptance rate. Nice Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, so this is a big difference, and it's really nice. Let me show you what this looks like in a real model, and how to do it. So this is the chimpanzee model again, with actor and block. Uh, just as before, this is a centered model because it has parameters inside the adaptive priors. Yeah, and it's sampled fine. We've got a few divergent iterations. Uh, what I want to show you is if we non-center it, decenter it, uh, make it into a non-centered parameterization, it'll be more effect, more efficient. So let's focus just on the linear model first. This is the first thing to wrap your mind around: is that linear model up top is now going to be written with these z scores and sigmas inside of it, right? Because each centered version of a parameter, like an actor is going to be some z-score for each actor, z sub actor, um, times the sigma among actors. And that rescales it. And then alpha bar is just out in front. We've taken that out of the prior two. And we've just put it inside the linear model. So it's the same, but it looks way worse, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks like a much harder model now. This is the trade-off. You can't have it all. Yeah. And then the same for block. I've made these things called x for block because I didn't want to have z twice. Uh, so now it's x scores. Uh, for block times the sigma, sigma gamma for the block uh, standard deviation. And the treatments are still fixed effects, so we leave them as they were. Yeah, makes sense? Um, and then the rest of the junk, right? So the, the new bit down here is where we used to have 
um, the alpha and gamma priors that were adaptive, we now have z normal 0, 1 and x normal 0, 1. So there's no vectors of parameters. These are varying effects, but they're standardized varying effects. And we have to destandardize them to make the correct predictions. And that destandardization happens inside the linear model. Fun? Yeah, I teach you this because there's really no avoiding it. This is the most important thing to understand about making varying effects models run right. And uh, lots of things are basically varying effects models because in complicated models, you often have distributions with conditional on other parameters. It happens all the time. So it's a usual thing. Factor models, all kinds of things have this phenomenon going on inside them. Good. Can I move on to the next slide? I have no reason to rush here. We can stay on this slide the rest of the time <laughs> if necessary. Okay. I know that you're like, no, please move on. <laughs> yeah, so in code, here's what it looks like. Uh, there's this really long linear model now. Yeah. Well, that's okay. It's all the same. And, uh, and now we've got z actor d norm 0, 1, x block d norm 0, 1. The rest is the same. It's that easy. Now, what does this get us? Uh, you run this thing. And again, you, you should really go home and run this and, and see for yourself. It'll also sample faster. Uh, you can compare the timings. This chain will run faster as well. Uh, and uh, the physics simulation runs better. Um, but what I'm doing here on this slide is I'm going to compare the effective number of parameters, effective number of samples per parameter for both models. These are structurally equivalent models, same data, same analytically the same posterior distribution. And they are, if you look at the Precy output, they're basically the same. Uh, they're the same posterior distribution for sure. Both of these have worked. Um, but so uh, nef sub c is the number of effective parameters, a vector of the number of effective parameters, sorry, number of effective samples per parameter for the centered model, which is the first one we did, and sub nc is the non-centered one. And I'm just showing you in this table per parameter, right, all the b's, all the a's, all the g's, then uh, uh, a bar and the two sigmas, those numbers, and the, they're always bigger uh, for the non-centered model. Sometimes double, right? So what does this mean? It means you don't need to run the chain as long. And with a really big data set, this is a huge savings. Yeah, I run models that take two, three days uh, to sample. I definitely worry about these things before I let it run for two, three days. Yeah, um, you don't need that many samples that you know run the chain for less time. Then I don't have to fight with my scientists for cores as much, right? Uh, does this make sense? Yeah, this is often just like uh, the best thing you can try. And as we have examples going in the next week, I'll often show you this trick. Uh, we're going to repeat this trick th next week as well and lots of things. There'll be a phylogenetic regression next week, and I'll show you how to do this with the phylogeny. <laughs> you can non-center the whole analysis and, and lots of stuff to make it work. Okay. <clears throat> Last thing that we really need to talk about uh, this week is how you do posterior predictions with multi-level models. And um, the answer is you've got to make some choices. Uh, now that there are different levels to interpret the model at, because it's multi-level, you, you, you get some agency back, and you get to decide how you want to think about the generalization of this model. There are different aspects of the posterior distribution which may be relevant to you depending upon your scientific purpose. And the most uh, direct way to consider these choices you can make is when you generalize your inferences from this sample, are you interested in new units like new chimpanzees, are you interested in the same chimpanzees? If you're interested in new chimpanzees, say at another colony, I think the ones that I showed you were in Texas, those are Texas chimpanzees, uh, you're going to pick Leipzig chimpanzees to make predictions for, you wouldn't get to use the alphas, right? Those alpha parameters are irrelevant to you. They're in the posterior, but you can't use them to make predictions for a Leipzig chimpanzee, or rather you shouldn't. Yeah, lefty, remember lefty's alpha, <laughs> right? You're not going to use that and just assign it to some random chimpanzee here at the zoo. Uh, however, the other parameters are definitely relevant because they tell you about some statistical population. You've learned about the variation possible in a colony of chimpanzees, uh, substantial, and that would give you a prior for what you do to design an experiment here. Um, so let me give you an example using the chimpanzee model of how you might project different kinds of predictions out from this thing. If you're interested in, in the same chimpanzees, it works very much like every chapter we've come to before. You just use those parameters to generate predictions. But in uh, other cases, you've got, some, you've got some choices. So 
when we do the new clusters, as I say at the bottom of this slide, um, you, you've got a bunch of different ways you can generate the predictions and different visualization options. So let's consider, um, uh, as I say here at the, at the bottom of the slide, if we had the same actors, you can just use link and sim as before. Uh, it works just the same as, as forever. You push samples back through the model, you get predictions for those chimpanzees. This is like posterior prediction check to make sure the model worked. If you've got new actors, this is a kind of counterfactual thing. Imagine sampling new actors from the population. Now we're, we're gonna literally do that inside the model. We're gonna sample from the adaptive prior in the posterior distribution and uh, get new chimpanzees out. And there are different ways to draw these and I'm gonna show you three. You can think about an average actor. What's an average chimpanzee like? And what are, what's its behavior gonna be like in a, new, in a new sample? I'll show you what that looks like. Then there's something else confusingly called marginal of actor. What does that mean? An average actor is literally like the average actor. So we take the average, statistically average chimpanzee, which is definitely a construction, maybe a dead space, right? But a statistically average chimpanzee, and we ask what the model says they would do. Uh, that would be a chimpanzee at the population mean, at alpha bar. Marginal of actor is different. Marginal of actor says, let's sample a bunch of statistical chimpanzees and average over their variation. That's what marginal of means. It means you marginalize over the distribution. And that's different, as you'll see, because it includes the population variation. And then uh, my preference, honestly, is usually just to show a sample of actors from the posterior as a bunch of lines. You know, I love these line plots, right? The posterior distribution is full of chimpanzees now, and we can plot them. It's just full of chimpanzees, infinite number of chimpanzees inside this posterior distribution. So one at a time, what's the average actor look like? Uh, this means the actor with the population mean intercept alpha, alpha bar, alpha equals alpha bar for the average actor. And how do we do this? Well, since you know the model, you know the model because you're taking my class and I have cruelly made you manually write the log posterior for every model we've done in this class. You're welcome. And that means you know how to manipulate the model and you can generate predictions for it, leaving out any bit you like or plugging in anything you want. And so we can do this uh, quite easy. Um, uh, as a trick here, all we have to do is replace the intercept samples all with zeros. Now all the actors have the average intercept. And then we can use link. Uh, so the way I've done this is we, we can extract the samples um, and then uh, just put in this big matrix of zeros for the actor zeros and uh, uh, run the link model as well. All this code is in the book, and you can run it and you know, draw the owl at home. Um, you can also just directly simulate it. So what do we get from this? Uh, we get a graph like this. You can focus on the code later when you go home. Uh, focus on this graph. Here's the average actor. It looks like a Charlie Brown shirt, <laughs> right? Is it zigzagging? Uh, and there's uncertainty about it, um, but that's the average actor. Uh, what about marginal of actor? Now we've got to sample a bunch of chimpanzees and we have to average over them. So we're going to generate a prediction interval for the whole population of them and as they vary. And some of those individuals are left-handed and some are right-handed and that makes it wider. Again, code's in the book. Um, and you want to go home and play with it. And uh, now you, it's the same Charlie Brown shirt, zigzag, but it's uh, much, much wider. Yeah? Why? Because the chimpanzees vary a lot. They're really different from one another. Does that make sense? And finally, um, the last thing to look at is instead of uh, drawing this as an interval, you can just sample a bunch of chimpanzees and draw them. Now these individual trends are chimpanzees. You have 50 simulated chimpanzees. It looks like more than 50. Well, it could be 50. <laughs> I say it's 50. Let's, let's say it's 50. And uh, uh, you'll see that one of the things that happens here is that um, because we're all, we're, there's a posterior distribution for all these parameters and there's this big wide distribution, occasionally you get individuals that are on the other end at zero. We didn't see any of those in our sample, but the model hasn't excluded them as possibilities. You could get extremely right-handed chimpanzees, just like lefty, and those are crowded up on the bottom. One's all the way at the top, uh, but you still see the treatment effect echoing through this, right? That's that zigzag effect. And that's something that you get to say. I, always, I often like plots like the one on the right hand of this slide because you see more, at least I see more. I don't know about anybody else, but I, you see more than you do if you draw the 
the compatibility interval, the big smooth space. You get to see that there's a bunch of individuals. You get to see, for example, that as an individual approaches either boundary, the treatments have less effect. Why? Because it's a generalized linear model. And you hit the ceiling or floor and you get less effect. Does that make sense? Good? Okay. You go home and you draw the owl and you'll see how this works. And when you have your own data and model, you make some decision about how you want to explore it and draw it this way. Uh, it, it always depends upon the scientific context of, of how this works. Okay. Um, homework. Uh, I have prepared a homework assignment that I like a lot. Uh, and um, uh, I still have yet to do it all, <laughs> but it is written and I will post it this afternoon. And what you're going to do uh, is, well, you, I call it frogs and contraception. It's not the frogs that have contraception. There's, there's data, multiple data sets. You're going to work with the read frog data some more. Um, and this is a basic varying intercepts model, but you're going to add predictors to the model. And I'm going to go ahead and, and give away the plot and say that the point of this is I want, us, I want you to look at, really focus on what happens to the variation among tanks as you add predictors to the model. So you're going to fit multiple models. Some will have more predictors than others. And then you're going to look at the sigma, the sigma among tanks across the different models and there will be a pattern, hint. <laughs> and uh, that's what I want you to focus on so that you learn what's going on uh, with these things. Um, the second data set is a historical Bangladeshi uh, contraception data set. Uh, it's a really nice data set. And I know this poster's from India, but this is all I could find with some quick Googling. <laughs> Not the same place, I know. <laughs> and uh, uh, in this, there will also be a varying intercepts model, and you're going to explore shrinkage in much the same way you explored it with the tadpoles. Uh, but now this is real data uh, of incredible consequence for planning. <laughs> uh, and I want you to explain the shrinkage pattern that arises uh, in the data set. Um, okay, with that, as always, thank you for your indulgence. When you come back on Monday, we're going to um, extend directly from here to add varying slopes. We're gonna let everything vary. Everything's gonna vary. And uh, I call this adventures in covariance because it opens up the possibility for a huge number of exciting things, including phylogenetic models and, and network models and other kinds of stuff. Okay, thank you, have a good weekend. It'll be very warm here in Leipzig, yeah? It's like spring is here. And I'll see you on Monday.